Good morning and thank you for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. Donald Trump announced a pair of choices that could have a big impact on the Lone Star State. Two Texans will now play prominent roles in the president-elect's administration. First, he chose ExxonMobil CEO Rex Tillerson to be Secretary of State. Trump praised the University of Texas alum for his tenacity and his business experience dealing with world leaders. But there is already talk in Washington that his Senate confirmation could be heavily debated. People in both parties have raised concerns about Tillerson's close ties with Russia. Former Texas Governor Rick Perry will also be heading to Washington. The president-elect announced that he wants Perry to lead the Department of Energy. The choice surprised some people, but Anna Wernicke looks at why others say Perry's Texas swagger is just what Trump needs. It reminds me of the little place I grew up. Trump's cabinet just gained a new pair of cowboy boots. 200 miles west of Fort Worth, Texas, in Haskell County. I think Governor uh, Perry's appointment to the uh, uh, Secretary of Energy is a great appointment. Kent Hans, former congressman and longtime friend of Perry, says if Trump wants to make America great again, he needs strong Texans like Perry in his inner circle. You know, he took Texas from being one of the also rands as far as wind engineering is concerned and made it one of the top. And it was Perry's success in Texas that caught Trump's eye. Who better to shake up Washington and change the status quo than uh, a Texan? So the fact that it's Governor Perry makes it even better. Michael Joyce with the Republican Party of Texas says the former Texas governor is 100% qualified and fit for the job. It's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. Commerce, education, and the, uh, uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. <laughs> Despite Perry saying in 2011 that he would nix the Department of Energy altogether. The third one I can't, sorry. <laughs> Oops. There is no better way to destroy our energy future than to put Rick Perry, the man who wanted to dismantle the Department of Energy in charge of it. It's Joyce defended Perry's Perry comments, Obama. saying that yeah. wanting to eliminate the agency solely has to do with reducing the size of government. The fact that he has such a diverse background overseeing oil and gas, renewables, nuclear, and overseeing that in an executive role in the state of Texas is really going to translate well uh, once he serves in President Trump's cabinet. If Perry is confirmed, he would become the third Texan to inherit the title of Secretary of Energy. Anna Warnicke for State of Texas. For perspective on the two Texans named to Trump's cabinet, we turn to our panel of experts. Patrick Svitek reports for the Texas Tribune, and Ray Sullivan served as Chief of Staff for former Governor Rick Perry. Have you talked to Perry? I have not. <laughs> He's been a little busy. A the little last bit, few yeah. Years. Yeah, I mean, it's probably a whirlwind. Uh, obviously, you know, he had been in discussions for a while. How do you think that process played out? Well, things were, you know, he met up in Trump Tower in November, and then things were pretty quiet. Uh, he ran into Donald Trump at the football game this weekend, the uh, last weekend, the Army-Navy game. Mm -hmm. Then he, next thing we know, he's at Trump Tower, and the announcement is forthcoming after that. Look, he had clearly worked hard for uh, Donald Trump in the general election campaigning here in Texas and across the country. The governor's got a strong record of leadership, 14 years of managing one of the largest, most complicated economies. Job leader, job creator, energy, all of the above energy portfolio in Texas. So he had a lot to offer the country, and I think Donald Trump saw that and put him in a, in a really important position. And I think it sounds like he handled, from what I can tell, the interview process pretty well. It seems like Donald Trump doesn't like these cabinet candidates who are very public with their ambitions, who have been out there openly campaigning for it. Uh, as Ray said, it kind of was quiet for a while. I know each time he went to Trump Tower, he kind of went in and out, didn't talk to reporters, kept his head down. Um, you know, yeah, so it seems like he handled the political side of the interview process pretty well. I guess when you think of Rick Perry's background, the first thing that many people think of is not energy, but he did have a big energy um, background as far as the 14 years he was a governor, yeah. oil and gas, and even a lot of wind energy experience. There are a number of things I think were good qualifications, and I've actually thought this since the beginning. He has experience managing a big complex organizations, whether it be reforming the Texas Department of Agriculture back when he was Ag Commissioner, or managing state government here in Texas. Texas is the most important energy economy in the country, one of the most important in the world. And it, we really do have an all of the above portfolio. Oil and gas, number one in both, number one electricity generation, number one in wind, number one, I think, in energy research and development in Houston. 
Uh, in addition, governor's a military veteran. He's an Air Force pilot, someone who understands the importance of weapons safety uh, of the military part of the energy department. So I thought it was a great pick for Trump. Yeah, when it comes to that part, we're talking about nuclear for mm -hmm. a lot of it, and that's not something that we talk about a lot in Texas. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think there are some questions there about, you know, where that fits into Perry's resume, but there's no doubt that, I mean, he is qualified for this position, just in, if not just in terms of sheer executive experience and, again, what, you know, as Ray said, with just the all-of-the-above approach that, uh, to energy that Texas has had uh, all over these years and especially under his tenure. With Rick Perry, will he actually get past that congressional approval? I think he absolutely will get confirmed. Uh, he knows a lot of those senators, certainly the Republican senators. He has a very strong track record of leadership. He is extremely well vetted. He's probably the most scrutinized elected official ever in Texas history when it comes to you all in the press and, and multiple campaigns. I think he'll be in good shape in, in the Senate. I think process. Democrats, too, and, and even some Republicans are going to have to pick their battles with some of these confirmation hearings, too. And I imagine Rick Perry is probably far down on that list as far as where they want to spend their political capital or where they want to exert their will. A little more questionable on that confirmation process is uh, the other Texan, the one for up for Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson. Um, a lot of people are wondering, will he make it past that point? Why is that? Uh, Look, the, the left is still in meltdown mode, and anyone associated with uh, traditional uh, oil and gas and corporate America, the left goes bananas about. Uh, the thing to remember about Tillerson and Exxon is uh, he managed one of the largest, most complicated, most competent companies in the world. He knows the players around the world. He has a skill set I think of diplomacy, of management, of picking his battles. Uh, he had to do that throughout his career at, at Exxon. And I thought it was a great choice. Someone who is not of the establishment, of the foreign policy establishment per se, but somebody who knows the world, knows how to manage huge organizations, and knows how to get deals done. And obviously that's what Donald Trump was looking for. Yeah, I, I didn't know so much about his background, you know, where he started in Exxon and how he's really risen to the top since then. And, you know, I was a former Boy Scout myself, so I was really interested to see about his scouting past. Rick Perry has that too, right? One thing to remember <laughs> for your viewers, you're going to have a Longhorn and an Aggie in the cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's happened before. <laughs> <laughs> a little contention right there. What do you think about Rex Tillerson's um, you know, nomination? Yeah, I mean, I think as far as the, some of the controversy surrounding his ties to Russia, I think there'll be uh, fair and thorough questions during the confirmation hearings about that. I imagine he'll ultimately get past them. I think one of the variables here is uh, whether we see this Russian uh, hacking story continue to broaden. There was a story uh, just last night about how, you know, Vladimir Putin may have been personally involved in this. And, you know, I, I think by all accounts, Rex Tillerson's ties to Russia are uh, in the context of business and in the context of uh, being a global player. Uh, but I'm interested to see how that influences the hearings, if that continues to widen as it's just a story. Um, again, there certainly is no connection there, but if that continues to weigh on the national kind of conscious, it'll be interesting to see how that, that story continues to factor into his confirmation. And just to bring it back home, how will those two possible appointments, how will they actually affect Texas? Will we see anything different swayed one way or the other because we have Texans in the cabinet? I think it's great for Texas. Uh, it's great to have Texans in those roles just to, to promote the uh, excellence of the state and the type of people that we uh, uh, generate. At the Energy Department, though, it is a, Texas is the most important energy state in America, one of the most important energy players in the world. Having a a strong oil and gas sector is good for this state, it's good for our tax base, it's good for our job creation. And then the, the wind and renewables that Governor Perry has, has championed and those energy technologies and energy research will benefit the state of Texas. What do you expect? Yeah, and I think it more broadly, it's just part of this, this ongoing conversation about having a Republican president, uh, you know, in addition to having Texans in the administration, it kind of just reorients the policy and political dialogue. Obviously, for the past eight years, uh, the Texas government has really been oriented in opposition to the federal government. I think you're obviously going to see a much more friendly relationship, and that's only bolstered by having Texans there to... Uh, you know, help out. And even though we're headed into the state legislative session, it gives us something else to talk about Texas related, <laughs> right? <laughs> Patrick, Ray, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Ahead on State of Texas, a new face in the Senate. The newest senator from Central Texas looks ahead to the challenges of the session.
providing new strategies to take children out of harm's way and put them into a safe place. This is something that required immediate action. Plus, we go one-on-one -on -one with Governor Abbott, how he's stepping up to tackle the state's CPS crisis. Lawmakers will likely make solving the state's CPS crisis a priority in the next session. KXAM political reporter Phil Prazen sat down with Governor Greg Abbott to get his perspective. The governor told him that the millions of dollars in emergency funds to the state's child welfare system is only step one. I was able to get $150 million more, uh, adding 800 uh, more employees, uh, providing new strategies to take children out of harm's way and put them into a safe place. This is something that required immediate action. Advocates would say this was kind of just the emergency. We need to stop the bleeding on this thing now. What else would you like to see done in the future? We will find out uh, the full extent to which we do need to provide more funding because we don't want to just uh, paste over the problem. We want to truly solve the problem. Governor Abbott echoed child advocates who say child protective services needs a comprehensive overhaul. The governor shared his perspective on several issues, including education funding and transgender bathroom policy. You can find that one-on-one -on -one interview in the politics section of KXAN.com. Ahead on State of Texas, Austin will soon have a new opening in the Texas House. See who's already lining up for the special election. First, a change for Central Texas. Our area's newest senator joins us with her take on the challenges of the upcoming session. The next session will bring 21 new lawmakers to Austin, and one of them won't have to travel far. Don Buckingham is a doctor from Lakeway who's taking over the District 24 Senate seat. She spoke with political reporter Phil Prazen to give her perspective on the upcoming session. And we're here with the incoming senator herself. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Buckingham, Senator Buckingham now. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Talk to me about what you have been doing now since the election ahead of the session. What's life as an incoming senator look like? Well, we've been really busy. We've been still traveling around the district, just being sure we're staying in touch with all of our constituents, thanking the folks who voted for us and getting to know some of those ones who maybe we didn't earn their support to be sure we earn it next time. We've been building our capital staff and getting our picking our capital office, so all kinds of exciting things going on. And what are when you're going around, what are your constituents telling you that the issues that they want you to tackle? Mm -hmm. You know, as we've been moving back across the district, the issues are the same as they were in the campaign. You know, mm -hmm. people want to be sure the border's secure, they want to have their children have the best educational opportunities, they're worried about traditional family values, just all those things that we were speaking about in the campaign. Nice. And you have already filed one resolution. Tell me about that. Well, you know, my fundamental belief is that government should be easy to understand and relatively simple. And so we did file the first Senate resolution. It is one sentence and just supports our congressional delegation to abolish Obamacare. Let's get into that issue a little bit of um, what's your beef with the Obamacare, Affordable Care Act? You know, my, my primary beef and really one of the big reasons why I decided to run for office is that everybody keeps trying to tell me what to do with my patients and none of it has to do with actually what's best for my patients. So what I've seen with Obamacare is that people have actually lost access to coverage mm -hmm. for the most part and with all of the quality reporting me measures and all of those types of things, we spend more time with our backs to our patients typing into a computer mm -hmm. than we do face to face really taking care of our patients like we need to. And so with the new Trump administration, Tell me how things are, are different now. Are, are you, I guess, would be optimistic of future changes. I'm very optimistic about health care in particular. I think now we have a friend instead of a foe in the White House. I think mm -hmm. we'll have an opportunity to build a Medicaid block grant. Mm -hmm. I think we'll have an opportunity to really lead the nation in delivering health care to folks who need it. And why is the block grant so important? That doesn't really tackle who um, is eligible, right, for Medicaid, but it, it, it tackles of what it would help being it would help target what services they get, right? Well, what a block grant allows us to do is it allows us to cut the federal string so the federal government isn't dictating everything we do with the money. So mm -hmm. it allows us to bring in some individual responsibilities, some free market 
approaches and really put the patient at the center of the health care, which is, I think is what we need to do. Uh, another issue that um, was a big issue in the campaign is, is border security mm -hmm. and, and what that would look like with the Trump administration. Um, what do you expect the Texas legislature to do, or I guess the Texas Senate in, in particular, now that Trump is, is the president? Absolutely. You know, as, as state legislators, um, our legislators had to stand up and fill the gap. The federal government should have been securing our border and they had no interest in doing so. So the state had to step in and fill that gap. What we're interested in now, I believe, is just a smooth passing of that baton, letting the federal government do what it's supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. looking forward to partnering with Trump and being sure that we not only secure our borders, but get rid of the lures such as sanctuary cities that bring people here. Let's, yeah, let's talk about you know the actual border, whatever that turns into, a fence, a wall, whatever that is. Uh, on the border and then also some of those lures you've talked about. Um, are you optimistic that, that we won't have to pay Texas tax dollars as much as we had last session? I am. You know, we, I don't think you can cut the mil, $800 million off mm -hmm. like a faucet. I think, you know, we have to have a smooth passing of the baton. Hopefully this next biennium we can spend a little bit less, but I anticipate it'll be pretty close to our previous expenditures mm -hmm. because the federal government is going to need time to ramp up and do what they need to do. Um, and when it comes to the sanctuary cities, or I guess now there are sanctuary campuses, there's all these different, um, I guess, lingo that's, that's out there now, um, and the devil's in the details on all this stuff. What, sure. what do you think is a sanctuary city, a sanctuary campus, uh, and what would need to be done about those? Sure. You know, I think we need to get back to the rule of law, which means that I find it amazing that some of our law officers, um, maybe even our Travis County Sheriff, can campaign on just picking and choosing which laws she decides to uphold. And so we need to follow the laws that we have. Mm -hmm. And um, if they need to be changed, let's change them. But if they're on the books, we need to follow them. And would this, what would you want, you know, the, you can't just, you can ban them, but are there going to be any sticks to this? Would you like to see funding cut or more penalties for sheriffs, colleges that kind of fight back about that? I, I want that? the biggest stick we can possibly have. I'm going to do everything in my power to end sanctuary cities in the state. An issue that also has come up during the, this campaign in Texas, I guess, is, is school choice, school finance. Mm -hmm. um, the leader of the Texas Senate, Dan Patrick, says you can't have school finance without some school choice. Are you in agreement with that? I do. You know, I think that we want to try and give our poorest, most disadvantaged students the same opportunities that our wealthiest students have. And to the extent that we can accomplish that as state legislators, I think that's a, a very admirable goal. Now, there's going to be possibly some of your local school districts are going to see that and say, you know, we don't like school choice. Or we don't, we don't like state tax dollars going out of the public school system. Um, how big of an issue do you think that will be? You know, I understand their concerns. Um, I sat on my Lake Travis school board. I mean, I understand their worry that they feel like they've been un underfunded for a long time. They've mm -hmm. been overregulated. They're worried they're going to be stuck or have to educate the most expensive kids and not have the funding to really do that correctly. So my goal is to be sure that we don't harm our public schools. Mm -hmm. But again, I, I, I want the children to have the educational opportunity that they need to succeed, whether they want to be workforce ready or college ready. And uh, news broke recently that you broke of uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, I, I swear I've heard it before from Texas Values, but um, that whatever the Senate bill dealing with bathrooms and who can go to what bathroom and why or uh, is, is going to be limited to schools. Do you think that still standing by that or do you think that is where the line needs to be drawn? Well, I, you know, that's my impression from a lot of the conversations I've heard. Mm -hmm. Clearly the legislation is being written, so we'll see what it, what it comes out as. Um, but I think that is, I know in my heart that's, that's my primary goal is we want to be sure that our kids are protected in their bathrooms and schools. Um, but, you know, we'll see what the legislation looks like. TAB, the Texas Association of Business, has, has come out against this to say that this could be a North Carolina situation where businesses would leave the state. Mm -hmm. um, thoughts on that? Is that a concern of yours? Well, you know, again, we just need to look at all the modifying factors. You know, we want Texas to be a very business-friendly state. We want to continue to grow and have great economic development. So we'll look forward to partnering with them. They're also against sanctuary, um, eliminating sanctuary cities and some other things that I feel pretty strongly about. So we may agree on some things and we may not on others. Any other issues you think that you're going to put your nose in to say we need to do something about that? 
you know, we, we do have some interesting grand jury reform ideas, mm -hmm. um, and we'll, we'll be seeing how those develop. You know, we'll be partnering with the other senators to help them pass their legislation that we agree with, and there's been a lot of it so far, like we already said, so we're just looking forward to the opportunity to serve. Now, have you and Senator Donna Campbell ha had any words? I thought she was going to be the only Central Texas doctor. In, <laughs> in, you know, well, I guess, and Senator Schwartner as mm -hmm. well. So there, it, what is it about doctors that get them elected to the Senate? <laughs> you know, I think, I think we're all very frustrated that, um, you know, everybody keeps telling us what to do with our patients and none of it has to do with actually what's best for our patients. And so I think that's why you saw two doctors running for president. Um, I think that's why you see a doctor in charge of health and human services at the federal level. I mean, we are stirred up and we're here to fight for our patients. Senator Buckingham, thank you so much for your time and thanks for coming by. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Senator-elect Buckingham is one of two newly elected lawmakers this session from Travis County. Last week on State of Texas, we spoke with Representative-elect Gina Hinojosa. She represents House District 49 here in Austin, but Austin will soon have another freshman House member. Democrat Donna Dukes says she plans to resign from her District 46 seat before the session starts. Duke says she's leaving office because of health issues, but she also faces an investigation into allegations she misused state funds. Former Austin Mayor Pro Tem Cheryl Cole announced last week she will run for the seat once Dukes resigns. District 46 covers parts of East Austin. Cole is one of four candidates who announced intentions to run, including fellow Democrat Namdi Arakwe, Republican Gabrielle Neela and Libertarian Kevin Ludlow. Governor Abbott would have to call a special election for the District 46 seat once Dukes leaves office. Thank you again for joining us for State of Texas. Stay tuned for an update on your local news and weather. And then it's Meet the Press coming up at 9. I'm Josh Hinkle. Have a great day.